In the early 80s, while working on the PBS show Wall Street Week, he began developing a pilot for a show that would combine his love of cars with his television background. Thus was born Motor Week. And 30 seasons later, television's longest-running automotive series is seen weekly by millions on PBS, the Speed Channel, and globally on the American Forces Network. Outside of TV, he works with the U.S. Department of Energy to promote public awareness of alternative fuels and green vehicle technology. Hello, I'm Ernie Manus. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with Motor Week host, car enthusiast, and Emmy Award winner, John Davis. Love of cars, always? Pretty much, Ernie. Um, I grew up, of course, teenager in the 60s when a lot of the muscle cars were coming out. My first car was a, an old Mustang, and the love affair grew from there. But I went to college to become an engineer, an aerospace engineer. I've always had a love for flight and airplanes. Basically, by the time I got out, I realized that was far too expensive a hobby. <laughs> and the fact that I had been rebuilding, you know, old cars to keep, uh, so I had transportation all through my college years, I sort of just naturally had this affinity for cars. But then, of course, I got away from it and didn't come back to it until uh, the early 80s. Now, a lot of people love cars, yeah. and especially in mm -hmm. the car world. Why do you think that is? What is it that draws somebody to these mechanical beings? Well, it's simply the fact that cars, I think, more than almost anything else we buy in our lives, reflect our own personalities. And also, we can change them relatively easy. I mean, it's you can't move from house to house every three or four years just because you're, uh, well, maybe a few people can, but I certainly can't. But you can basically upgrade your car or buy an older car and start it as a hobby, you know, fixing it up. So cars really do reflect a lot about us. And even if you're one of those folks that says, I only buy a car because uh, I want it to get from point A to B reliably. And, and so in other words, you're buying an appliance. If you look at what appliance they buy, I guarantee you it says something about them. So we're in an age of personalization now with cars, with all these fancy electronics. Well, cars have always been a personal reflection of who you are or your aspirations. So I think cars really, they say you are what you drive, and I really do believe that. Is there a psychology to it? If you meet someone and mm. see their car, can you tell me something about that person? I think you can. If it's filthy, then they're probably a slob. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if it's pristine and has been uh, recently uh, detailed, I think it says a lot about their values. I think you can look and see whether it's a car that's excessive, and maybe that has something to do with maybe their personality happens to be very outgoing. So I think within a certain realm, you can tell a little bit about a person. I wouldn't want to be a an automotive uh, psychologist or anything, <laughs> but I think it's sure. I think it does. You get an opportunity to drive an awful lot of cars. Yeah. What do you currently drive for your own personal use? Do you have your yeah. own home car? Yes, I do. As a matter of fact, most folks that test cars for a living, we drive so many cars. Like we drive 150 different new cars a year. You never drive your own, but I have a household and so we have cars. Um, my current toy is a, a <laughs> 2002 a Mini Cooper. And I bought it basically to replace a Mazda Miata. So I like to have one sort of toy in the garage. And as it turns out, with fuel prices going up, my wife actually drives it most of the time. It's very fuel efficient. It's, it's like a boxy little sports car, so it's fun to drive. And that's kind of my toy. We've got a pickup truck and something to carry the dogs in. And, <laughs> and because we live in, in Maryland, we've got the, uh, the all-wheel drive, an old all-wheel drive Volvo wagon. But that Mini is kind of the car that both my wife and I just love to drive. And I drive it every chance I get. But usually I have to steal the keys from her. <laughs> okay, take me way back. Yeah. I want to know about entering into the television world. Wasn't what you set out to do. Oh, no, 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 no. I, would, I was going to North Carolina State University in, in Raleigh to uh, become an aerospace engineer and uh, went on and got an MBA from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And I worked my way through college, started with um, uh, the campus radio stations, then went on to work for a couple commercial stations as weekend disc jockeys and so forth. 
And by the time I got over to uh, UNC, I was actually doing sports and uh, booth announcing for a small NBC affiliate in our market. And so I had been in TV and radio really since uh, I started college. But it was fun, and it was, a, it was not something you know, my career was going to be. So I left uh, UNC, ended up in New York on Wall Street for a brief period of time, couldn't get the broadcasting bug out of my veins. What were you doing on Wall Street? Uh, I was a transportation analyst. I basically took the engineering and the finance, put them together, and I was hired by a company to look at companies like uh, airlines and trucking companies, primarily in railroads, write reports for investors, and basically see if they wanted to buy the stock. So I was a stock analyst. And that was my job. And I did it for a little over a year. And frankly, it was bored to tears. <laughs> Uh, you know, I miss the lights. I miss the, uh, the, just the enjoyment of broadcasting. And, of course, it's a very extroverted uh, business. So then I was uh, with a, in a friend of mine's apartment one day. Uh, he lived on the top floor of the building, and I had an apartment that was a, a converted uh, paint storage room. But I would go up there <laughs> because he had the view, and he got the New York Times on Sunday. And we were looking through the paper, and I was looking at the want ads. And here was a little or a want ad. Uh, a uh, station in Maryland was looking for a producer for a financial series, and they were looking for a business and television background. And I said, all right, you know. And in those days, the salary was not that much different that they were offering from what I was making. So I uh, put on my best suit and flew down to Owings Mills, Maryland, and took a cab out to Maryland Public Television and interviewed with a lady named Ann Truex Darlington who was the executive producer of uh, Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser. And um, she gave me the job. So that was uh, in uh, the fall of uh, 1973. So how early was that show at that point? Is it that was in its second season. It had just okay. finished its second season. It went on in 71, and this was the fall of 73. This was going to be the beginning of the first season where they would go year-round. So they never paused after that. And Ann was just looking for a line producer. I think I came in as a associate producer and then became producer and then executive producer and then senior executive producer over the years. And uh, s until the show went off, basically, I was still had my name on the credits. So then somewhere along the line, you get the right. bug. It was 1978, and I became executive producer of Wall Street Week. And my boss, Warren Park, who's director of programming, Call me in and said, okay, now we have to see whether or not you can do something on your own. So we want you to develop some pilots. And I had dabbled in some other specials that the station wanted to do over the years. And I thought, great. And I actually developed two pilots. One was a personal finance series, but I really wanted to do a car show because no one had successfully brought the automobile magazine to television. There had been a couple of efforts, but nobody had succeeded. So um, we did the financial show. We did a pilot for Motor Week, and we called it Motor Week from, from day one. Uh, and uh, that was 1978. Sat on a shelf. We showed it to the networks, and I remember one programmer told me basically, uh, John, as a host, you're a very good producer. In other words, don't, <laughs> don't quit your day job. We had no money, so I couldn't hire anybody you know, to do the hosting, and I was stiff as a board. It had been a long time since I'd been in front of the camera. So at that point, uh, it sat on a shelf. And then in um, July the 5th, 1981, my boss calls me in his office and says, uh, someone else is going to be doing a car show on public television. And would, you know, they're going to be on in January. And, you know, not really sure if they took our idea or it just happens to be a happenstance. And we didn't have any details, but he said, you know, can you be on the air in six months? I looked at him and I said, Warren, I'll be on the air in six weeks. <laughs> didn't quite make that, but we did go on in October, and uh, that was the beginning of Motor Week, and uh, we have not missed a week since. Wow. So, okay, I want to just, though, clarify one thing. We said nobody right. had gotten a television show about cars right. What was it you did different in your concept that made it click? Well, I don't think anybody had had the concept of doing, at least in the U.S., of doing a weekly or even monthly automotive series that emulated the, the automotive magazines like Motor Trend, Car Driver, and, and so forth, the Road and Track. I wanted to be part of that. I was a car enthusiast. Now, yes, you had 
consumer reports out there doing car reports, but <clears throat> they looked at things from a non-enthusiast point of view. So I was a car lover. I wanted to do that. Uh, there had been a couple of attempts to do limited uh, once a year, here's all the new models. The only car show I could find in the world that was doing anything like I was doing was a show in Australia that was called Torque. And uh, watched some episodes of that. I had a friend that had done some uh, road tests for a magazine that goes to dealers, got some of their tapes. And I just looked at it and said, okay, we can't be just for the enthusiasts. That's too narrow. Uh, we've got a broader audience we've got to talk to here. So I need some road test and car enthusiast stuff, but I also need to make sure that this is a show for people who just own cars that want to know how to live with them better. A strange thing is that my mom is a huge fan mm -hmm. of you and Motor Week. Thank you. My mom doesn't drive a car. My mom doesn't have a driver's <laughs> license. There's something in the show that connects with an audience that just wants to know information. And I think that's what's so interesting mm -hmm. about your program. We get asked that question or hear that comment a lot, and I have to say it's, it is important to us that we are talking to everyone that owns a car, even if you're not an enthusiast. A lot of people are transient viewers. They will come to us for that brief 16-week period or so before they buy a car to kind of get a sense of what's new. Other people, of course, stick with us long term. Uh, Pat Goss, uh, he used to be a teacher, so he's very, very uh, keen about not talking down to people. We use industry jargon, but we explain it and we use it sparingly. We don't assume that you know what a McPherson strut is. We will mention it, but we will talk very little about it. Does that get harder the more years you've been on the air? Uh, I don't think so. I think actually in some ways it's gotten easier. Uh, the only thing that gets difficult is when a car company comes out with a new gadget, or some new driver aid. Maybe it's a, an adjustable suspension that does something specifically. And I can't take the time to really explain it. For that, you need to either go to the magazine or to a website. We will mention it, and then we will talk about what it does for you. And that's the key. They call it in the auto industry feature benefit. We're much more interested in telling you what the benefit or lack thereof than details of the feature because we can't yeah. do it. We don't have the time. In more recent times, yeah. the auto industry seems to be almost this villain out there. The kind of, a lot of negative press going on. There always For, has been. But the bailouts, the yeah. uh, recalls, things like that going on. Has there been a shift in what's going on, do you think, in the industry? When we started, we were probably the only positive thing you could find in the media about automobiles, uh, largely because, I should say the electronic media, largely because you had, in those days, the, the Ford Pinto problems with fires, you had the GM exploding pickup trucks. Uh, yes, the imports were doing well, but they were small, and so it was like nobody really cared. They, they didn't grab the headlines. So really, that was still there. The only difference now is that, of course, news is more immediate. And the Toyota situation and what's plagued uh, them and other imports is purely uh, a factor of them getting larger. They've now become a major player. When Toyota became the number one car company in America and basically for a period of time you know, beat GM in sales on an annual basis, that put a lot of attention on them that was shifted from Detroit. Mm -hmm. they were probably not prepared for it. So when they started to have their recalls, they just didn't know how to handle it. I don't really have any other explanation. I don't think they were deceptive, but I think when you look at uh, it was a new experience for them, they weren't prepared for it, and then you combine that with the culture of their home country, Japan, which is different from here, uh, it didn't mesh. And, of course, uh, because they were so big, they were in the limelight, and they had trouble responding. When they did finally get their act together, they came back with a very strong response, and they're going to continue that. But, you know, it, it's in some ways it was bound to happen uh, simply because a lot of the imports uh, had gotten this aura that somehow they were super automobiles, that they never broke down, mm -hmm. that they never had problems. And those of us in the industry knew it wasn't true, and I could show you lots of technicians that – whose shops only survive because they are working on import cars. And uh, it was bound to happen sooner or later. It's a shame it happened so catastrophically, but uh, I think it was inevitable. 
true or false, I've heard people say that if a really well-made car that doesn't break down, doesn't need a mm -hmm. lot of maintenance, is out there, the companies will stop making it. It doesn't help them to have a car that just keeps going. Well, that's an interesting comment. And when I was a kid, I think that was true. If you had a new car in the 60s, by 20,000 miles, everything had to be replaced. I mean, the tires were shot, the, the, the belts were shot, the hoses you'd probably changed already, shocks, everything. If anything, now, with a relatively small amount of maintenance, uh, a car should easily last you 100,000 miles without major repair. That's why a lot of manufacturers are offering 100,000 mile powertrain warranties for five, six, seven years. You don't offer a warranty if it's going to cost you money. You offer a <laughs> warranty to get people into your showrooms, yeah. but then you've got to be able to back it up. So if anything, while that could have been true in the 60s and before, it's not true anymore. I mean, there are lots of people that are keeping cars on the road for a quarter of a million miles with relatively little maintenance, but they do require routine maintenance. And that's actually a place where I think the car companies do a disservice. They, for the most part, have this attitude that they don't want people to feel like they've got to do anything, like the car is perfect. We all know that's not true. But if you take any car and you change the oil, you know, four times a year and you do a certain maintenance at 10, 20, 30,000 miles and keep up with it, preventive maintenance, uh, the car will last virtually indefinitely. There's a, a saying in the repair business that, you know, grease is cheaper than steel. <laughs> and it's very true. Yeah. Preventive maintenance has always been the key. But now cars are much, much more reliable. And I'm saying all cars. It's almost impossible to buy a vehicle today that is a bad design or poorly assembled. Those companies are not selling cars here anymore. When you go in for those routine things, mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people, this happens to me right. all the time, go in for the oil change, technician comes back with their little clipboard and it says, you know, also for $70 you can have this done. <laughs> How do you know what you sure. should be buying into? Well, first thing you do is actually get out the repair manual, or I should say the warranty manual and the repair schedule that's with the car. If your car's new and under warranty, I recommend that's the minimum you should do. You should follow whatever schedule's in there. However, beyond that, once the car is out of warranty, then I think it takes a little bit of common sense. Go to a trusted source. For instance, if you want to see a list of when you should do all sorts of types of routine repair, we have it on our website at motorweek.org, or you can get to us through pbs.org. And you click up at the top, Goss's Garage, and you've got a list of oil change, belts, everything else. And Pat keeps this updated based on new technology. For instance, belts and hoses, you don't change nearly as frequently as you used to. Uh, the one area that we still stick to pretty much four times a year, 3,000 miles, uh, is oil changes. And it's not because the oil isn't good. It's because we live in an increasingly congested climate and the oil gets dirty. And the oil mm -hmm. filters don't always clean everything out. So you're trying to get all the dirt out of the oil and because the additives that they put in there to keep the engine from wearing, they often wear out after about three, four, five thousand 5,000 miles. So you know, sometimes you can go a little longer with a synthetic oil, but an oil change is just the cheapest thing you can do to keep your car running strong if you're going to last a long time. Let me take you over something <laughs> else, the automotive bailout. Mm -hmm. Do you think those were handled as they should have been? <clears throat> The automotive bailout, particularly for General Motors, because the you know, taxpayer ended up with so much of the company, I was a defender of it for reasons that may not, may, many people may not understand, but the United States is uh, an industrial nation. To lose the homegrown auto industry, where companies that are American companies control the infrastructure, I think would have been very, very serious. At the same time, I think another 300,000 or so unemployed could have made a very, very bad recession into a depression. You already had a depression atmosphere in Michigan and some other Midwestern states. This could have sucked in most of the rest of the country. So I think when you stand back and look at what might have happened to the country as a whole, it was a good move. Uh, I think the critics that th say the money will never be paid back are pretty much already being proven wrong, uh, and I think the money will eventually all be paid back, and the companies will be independent companies again, not sure how quickly, 
But I think in the long term, just like when the government bailed out Chrysler back in the 80s, I think it will turn out to actually be a positive thing for shareholders, and they'll, and the, uh, meaning you and I, and I think the American public will actually see it as a, where we made a little bit of money. Good wake-up call <clears throat> for the industry, or? Oh, well, it, it was more attention? than a wake-up fall for the industry. I mean, basically, they, they, not, they weren't just on the precipice. They were over. Uh, yes, the industry had been getting itself in trouble for a generation. Uh, and it was just everything finally collapsed on them. It was a house of cards. I don't think most of us that follow the industry saw it very clearly. Uh, we drank the Kool-Aid just like everybody else. Yeah, we knew GM was in trouble, and we kept hoping that we'd get out of trouble, and then they would bring out a couple of good products, and it would look better. Chrysler would have very gigantic ups and downs. Ford, same way. People don't realize Ford almost went bankrupt first before Chrysler and GM. Uh, so we saw the troubles, but the industry had always rebounded because we'd never gone through such a financial disaster that we saw in uh, 2008-9 and uh, just getting out of it in 2010. And, you know, purchasing just dried up. It wasn't that it slowed down. We went from a $17 million a year uh, business to a $10 million a year. And even if the break-even point was somewhere around 13 or 14 at that point, uh, they, we were selling nowhere near enough vehicles in this country to reach that. Now, after the bankruptcies and everybody tightening their belts, probably uh, 12 million units will be profitable, and that means that virtually everybody is going to be profitable in the business. Yeah. When, when you are profitable in the car business, you are very profitable very fast, but then you also lose money very fast as well. Do you miss the days, or are the days gone, where someone could just tinker under the hood now you need to have your computer degrees and all of the. I mean, they're a lot different down there than they used to be. You can't tinker under the hood much anymore. That's yeah. true. But to suggest that the car culture somehow has gone away because of all the electronics and the government mandates to seal off systems, I think is wrong. Because if you look at the aftermarket business, which used to be you know carburetors and things of that sort, now it's wheels and tires, it's uh, dress-up kits under the hood and on the outside, the organizations that sell uh, the SEMA, which is the blanket organization that represents all of the aftermarket uh, accessory people, it's bigger than ever. Their conventions are larger than ever. Uh, uh, everybody that's in the car culture, there's more people than ever before. So while you do have that section of the public that sees themselves as hugely practical and only buying a vehicle to go from A to B, there's still an enormous amount of the public that buys a vehicle that wants to personalize it. And we used to identify that with folks my age, but if all you got to do is go to any neighborhood where there's a lot of teenagers or young or folks in their 20s, and instead of basically having the, uh, uh, the hopped-up Buick, you know, they've got the hopped-up Toyota Honda or something of that ilk uh, with the big mufflers, and we've heard them all. Uh, as they pass by our doors at night, well, that's not a whole lot different than when I was growing up. It's just the cars may not be the same brands. So I don't for one minute believe that uh, the car culture is dead or that that enthusiasm is gone. I think it is because the population is growing, maybe not as prevalent, but it's still alive and well. Yeah. What new challenges lie ahead for you in Motor Week? After all these years yeah. on the air, how do you keep it fresh? I get that question, too, a lot, and my answer is we, I cover an incredibly dynamic industry. It is literally new every week. I mean, not just the cars are new, but the headlines are new. Uh, I mean, companies can come and go so quickly. So keeping up with all of the new technology is a big challenge, and being able to convey it to folks in a meaningful and a way they can use, that's a big deal. Of course, with uh, everyone concerned about the environment, we spend more and more of our time on green issues and really have for almost the last 10 years. Around 2001, we started getting involved with uh, green issues when it came to automobiles, and we do more and more about it. And looking ahead with uh, more hybrids, all electric cars, extended range electric cars like the GM Volt, uh, all of that stuff opens up whole new areas to test cars and be able to show people why this particular model is practical. I mean, an all-electric car is not going to be practical for a lot of people, but there's certainly a section of the market that it will be. 
And yes, it will be very cheap to run until the government decides to start putting taxes on all <laughs> the power you use to charge your car because they are losing gasoline taxes, and you know that's going to happen. Right. Uh, other clean fuels, such as natural gas, uh, you know, hopefully will become more uh, prevalent. To, there's no reason that cars can't be running around on natural gas all the time, especially if you have gas service in your community or at your home, so you can uh, fill it up there overnight. Where they do that, it works very well. So there are a lot of opportunities. I really believe that technology is going to solve most of the problems that people attribute to automobiles and other things that foul the environment. It has so far. I think it will continue to do it in the future. Uh, on the other hand, I think traditional cars with gasoline or diesel engines are going to still be around and still be the dominant vehicle 20 years from now, but they will be lighter, they will be smarter, the engines will be hugely more efficient, they will be very technology laden, and uh, there will be more things for us to talk about. So well, I'm not I, at all worried about running out of stuff to talk about. I hope about. you'll be here 20 years from now still telling us and showing us and still having Motor Week. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Ernie. Thanks for having me. John Davis. To order a DVD of this or any episode of interviews, please visit HoustonPBS.org.